we just sort of had to find our, you know, the base of why we wanted to do this in the first place and kind of go back and rekindle that, you know, the, the fire that you have when you're a kid trying to learn how to play an instrument or when we first started the band, it was all new and exciting. And, and then, you know, on this record, we found that we'd been doing it for 10 years and, and we were doing a lot of the things the same old way and without even realizing it and we weren't really communicating with the band very well and we weren't talking enough and and we really had to step back from it and and it actually got sort of it took sort of a violent turn you know not physical violence but it got pretty ugly and and you know butch said i can't take this anymore i got to get out of here and we had to really go home and, and kind of think about why what the hell we were doing with this whole band thing and and luckily um, that was all for the good because we found that it was only after a couple of weeks, really, we were like talking on the phone again and sending emails about song ideas. And, you know, we realized that we really do love what we're doing and we've got something special going on and, and we wanted to continue and, and try to make this uh, album really incredible. And, and I think we did. I think we did. We're really excited about it. That is actually kind of true. Did you see that Metallica movie, Some Kind of Monster? With uh, He was sort of our Dr. Phil. I mean, he did sort of fill a role in sort of kicking our ass into realizing that we are really good at what we do and there's nobody that can do it for us and we have to do it ourselves. And so he was sort of a surrogate in that in that sense. And, and it was good for us because, you know, we said, you know, we don't need somebody to tell us how to do this. We just have to get our shit together and do it ourselves. So it was great. I don't know. He's a pretty mellow kind of guy, to be, you know, to be fair. I'm sure probably you'd be better asking him that question. But he handled it with great grace. And he was dealing with a band that were barely on speaking terms at the time that we were working with them. So he was put in a very uncomfortable position. God bless him. So we have nothing but absolute admiration for him. Oh, we love him. Everybody loves him. Mr. Personality is adored worldwide. He intimidated, that's for sure. <laughs> He's got nothing to be intimidated about. He's awesome. I mean, he came in and, and the first take he did on the drum, the drums on Bad Boyfriend was just like one of the greatest things I'd ever heard in a studio. And it was just like, he, you know, he listened to the song like twice and said, okay, fine. And it takes me about three weeks to listen to something and remember how it goes. And, and he was he just had it in his head right away and, and played the hell out of it. It was amazing. I wish I was a close friend with Dave Grohl, but I can't say I am. I mean, he's a friend of, of Butch's and he did it as a favor to Butch because they obviously have a long history together, you know. And uh, we are just absolutely in awe of Dave Grohl and just delighted that he, he played on one of the tracks. And, um, you know, I know that Butch and him have a, a special relationship that they admire one another and they've gone through some crazy times together. So it's, it's incredible. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Queens of the Stone Age and a huge fan of Marilyn Manson and, um, it was really incredible to get to work with the, these people, you know. They're amazing. And, yeah, it was. It was a riot. <laughs> I mean, it was a riot. I just call him Daddy because I think it's funny because the only Mr. Manson I know is my dad. So I would call him Daddy and he'd keep on saying, don't call me Daddy. It's not funny. <laughs> Which, of course, made me want to call him Daddy all the more. But uh, I, us sharing, you know, the same... Surname was funny because I would call and he'd go, hello. And I'd go, Manson? Yeah, Manson. It just got very confusing. So in the end, it was easier for me to call him Daddy or Pops. <laughs> he hated it. Don't you want me, baby? And it's fantastic, but I don't think either of us felt it was right for our records. I mean, I hope that one day it comes out for something because our voices together, it's literally like Beauty and the Beast. Like, I sound really sweet. And he sounds, of course, like like Daddy does. So he, it just is a great mixture and a dichotomy, you know, between the two sounds. 
and um, it was really a laugh to record with him. And I love him. I think he, I can't say enough good things about him. I think he's incredible, incredible artist. <laughs> I did play with his dildo cam. I was quite fascinated by it, actually, I have to say. Oh, don't worry, I didn't put it anywhere near my mouth. Or any orifice, for that matter. Oh, it is. It's so evil. Well, it's getting more evil all the time. I mean, if the current guys have their way, well, I guess it'll be all immaculate conception kind of things going on. I don't know. They, they don't seem to want us to have any fun at all. We all got very involved, actually. We all ended up doing, like, political sort of volunteering, which was hilarious. We I mean, we are, like, the laziest, most jaded motherfuckers in the world. And we managed to get off our arse and actually get up and try and do something. I was manning the phone banks. I was manning the phone was banks. Calling people up. Hi, my name's Shirley, and I'm phoning from Planned Parenthood of Madison, Wisconsin. And I just was wondering if you have decided who you're going to be voting for in this election. That kind of thing. It was so ridiculous. But I think all our worlds, whether you live in states or not, we're all being impacted by the decisions that are being made in that administration. So I felt very much that it was a matter of we, you know, we had to really do something. And so we did our best, but unfortunately it wasn't enough. Yeah, I think we've always been more, a little bit more about personal politics and we've never really spoken out publicly as much as, as a lot of people do. You know, sometimes musicians can get kind of overbearing with uh, spouting off about politics. But I think, the, you know, the way the world's going now, it's, it's really a responsibility. You really have to you get out there and say what you feel because, you know, it's a very serious and grim situation with the people that are leading us right now. And, but I don't think there's any choice. If you think about things at all, you pretty much are going to have an opinion. And I think it's important to express that and I think we did on this record more than we ever have in the past yeah I suppose it was looking back on it I suppose it was although it also had some of our most guitar driven tracks in it too I mean I th I think we were struggling on the last record to find the vein that we wanted to sort of hoe the last record was a really fascinating experience for us because we tried a lot of different things that we hadn't tried before. And um, it sort of led us to the place where we began this record, which was, I think, we wanted to ultimately just concentrate on a record that sounded as close to how we sound live as possible. Whereas, you see, the way that we came together... On Garbage's first record, we'd all been in bands before and we'd played, we'd made records that sounded like bands playing live. And so the, the luxury of Garbage originally was that we could fool around in the studio and really examine technology and play it around with it and utilise it. And that was the sort of fascination for us at that time. Having had a 10-year career before Garbage, essentially just a plain punk sort of rock and roll band, and um, now we've kind of gone full circle and we're back to wanting to like capture that feeling on record, I suppose. Well, that had something to do with it. I mean, I had to take, I couldn't sing pretty much for, well, it took a while for my surgery to, to actually come up the date for my surgery. So all in all, it sort of took six months out of the whole thing because I couldn't sing up until having the surgery and then I had to recuperate and so on and so forth. So it was a bitch. Yeah, that was the dark ages. It really was. It was terrible. It was very upsetting. <laughs> I was very traumatised. There was a lot of traumatisation going on in this record, you know, in all of our lives. And, and I think that sort of forced us into deciding, well, do we want to do this or not? And if we do, we, we need to, you know, do it strong do it right do it simple and not it's really easy for us to throw a million ideas at, on the tape and and kind of hide it with a bunch of studio trickery and a million vocals and 10 million guitars and you know we can do that all day long and it would sound pretty cool and i'm sure some people would like it but for us to 
decide, okay, this is nail down the idea that you want to you want to do, whether it's a vocal or the guitar, and just do that in the best way that you can and simple and straightforward. I think that's more of a challenge, at least for us. And, and so that's kind of the obstacle we, we face was just trying to be clear about what we were trying to say. And that's what took so long. You know, it'd be great if we could do it in a week, but that's not us. You know, we... we take a million different roads to get there. <laughs> but that had a lot to do with it too, and the fact that we couldn't really spend as much time as we have in the past because we would just irritate each other. No, it never gets that nasty and garbage, and that's the problem. It's always it's passive, passive aggressive. Part. It never gets that nasty, and that's because having a good fight always clears the air. But it's when you don't fight, and instead you just sit there seething with hatred and anger and loathing. <laughs> where was i that morning yeah it was we weren't actually working at the time so you know we saw the remains of it well, it was pretty cool for some reason the corner our little studio's on and you've seen it right and and it's just uh, clock cars are always plot that's, well, that's a boat, a boat, a boat drove into it before. yeah a boat hit the building and then people's cars get smashed into my car got smashed billy didn't billy's yeah. car get smashed once and it's just a, a nasty place don't go there. It was like, finish this fucking thing up quick or really bad or things are going to happen. Yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, it was like a sort of a warning sign from up above. Yeah, I had perioral dermatitis, but I didn't try yoga this time. I tried yoga some years back and it made me so angry that I just never did it again. Just, I couldn't bear it. I don't know, but I did. It just irritated me. It made me feel ill. Don't like yoga. Yoga's not for me. No, I'm not interested in Kabbalah either. I ain't interested in anybody's group. Thank you. I don't think it's a sect. I think it's just people searching for something, you know. And I don't think they even properly practice Kabbalah, to be honest. I mean, the majority of people don't, you know. I mean, it's incredibly... Isn't Kabbalah the intellectual you know, side of Judaism. I mean, it's like, I don't think the Hollywood set are spending much time on all that, but whatever. Whatever, you know what? Whatever <laughs> helps you get through your sordid little day in the Hollywood Hills. Yeah, I don't know, at least she, I mean, she's highly super intelligent. So, I mean, she's got a great high IQ. So I can imagine at least she may be well delving into the actual, you know, the nitty gritty of it. But I don't think the majority of people even have begun to grasp I don't know, I just, you know, it's hard to escape Paris Hilton. She's become sort of like the Angelina woman, you know. She, to me, that's kind of what she's becoming. And I, I can't help but be sort of fascinated by that. I mean, it, she's everything that I'm not, so I've, I'm obviously mildly attracted to my opposite. Is your latest thing where she got busted for stealing her own sex DVD, shoplifting? She stole it? Yeah, like last week. See, I love that about that girl. Fucking go for it. Steal your own porno film. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> White trash. Swamp <laughs> slut. Yeah, and I, I mean, I noticed that I, it's a combination of all these things you start to notice. I mean, and the fact that, you know, this current American administration is really trying to stamp down hard on women's rights, uh, reproductive rights, which I find absolutely terrifying I mean I just I'm 100% pro-choice I don't think it's right that anybody else dictates to another person what they do with their bodies and their life their blood and their genes and their cells I just don't think it's appropriate and I believe very strongly in it that'll probably that statement alone will probably get me killed by some lunatic somewhere but you know I just feel I have to come out and support that issue because I find it very frightening and I think ultimately it's about the subjugation of women. And I am utterly opposed to that, as you can imagine. <laughs> I love Howard. I think he's hilarious. The official view is that he subjugates women, but from, all, from everything I've ever seen, the women are willingly going to that studio and allowing themselves to be there. So I don't believe in any kind of censorship of, of you know, art. <laughs> Well, I think if 
the person who is who's in question has willingly participated, then I don't really necessarily see how it's degrading. I think that's somebody's personal choice. How we all choose to view that choice is really down to the individual. But um, I think you have to respect somebody's choice if they wish to appear in a music video, hip hop video, whatever, in whatever state they wish they have chosen to appear in, that's really up to them. When it becomes degrading is when somebody is put in a position where they're unwilling or being forced into some dreadful situation that they wish no part of, then I think that's inappropriate and I absolutely abhor that idea. But I don't think that's really occurring in all these videos. I think people are willingly, desperately, enthusiastically joining in. Well, the idea of that song is really about... I hate how, you know, there are stereotypes of women out there. There's the man-eater or there's the subservient male-pleaser. And what I love about Bad Boyfriend or the idea behind Bad Boyfriend is it's about a sort of equal two-way street because it's a really lusty song and it's definitely a provocation on equal footing. It's a challenge to a male counterpart, I suppose. It's about the balance, the equality between men and women, that you can be, a woman doesn't have to be a little shimmering, shy, shrinking violet, nor does she necessarily have to be a man-eater. She can be somewhere in between and have, what am I trying to say? I can't really articulate myself. And a power, sort of like a um, powerful exchange with an equal it's like you're a bad motherfucker well so am i come on let's go it's not about i'm gonna you know i'm gonna eat you and give you the best ride of your life it's 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 about it's a it's a challenge and a duel between two parties it's a little about that i mean it, all the songs are actually and apart from bad boyfriend for the most part are sort of running on, on a lot of different themes at the one time. There's not one necessarily, like, one story to each song. I mean, Boys Want to Fight is about some of the stereotyping that goes on, but it's also, unfortunately, a, about some of the behaviour that go, goes on that is so, you know, it's history repeating itself just over and over and over again and nobody learning any lessons from that. It's not just the British, it's just the human nature. He's been very generous. I love him. I also have a charity at home in Scotland that he has supported with his... been very generous and raised a lot of money for my own country, so I love him. He is a one in a million, and he, to me, he's still an, a provocateur, you know, he's still continues to push, albeit in his own unique way, you know, I find him fascinating. He's the last of a dying breed. And I love his sense of humour, you know, I love the fact that he really has lived the life. I mean, he has done it all. He has been, uh, he's lived a really incredibly debauched life. And he has also, you know, lost everything he ever had you know he became completely sort of bankrupt and you know his career was on the rocks and he was you know severely addicted to drugs and alcohol and what have you and he picked himself up and as a result he's really very <laughs> honest and very upfront and he doesn't really have any airs and graces you know for somebody who's so huge that's such a huge icon he's very down to earth I mean you could literally take him to meet your mum and you would feel comfortable with him in the room <laughs> Actually, right after we get done with this uh, little visit to Los Angeles, we're going back and start rehearsals. We rehearsed for about a month. Yeah, in Madison. And uh, I think that, isn't that show our first one in the however many years we've been off the road? And so we're extremely excited. And it's going to be pretty wild to, to step back on a stage after so long. And in a way, this album is sort of, you know, geared towards playing it live. And I think that's... You know, we're excited about getting it out, but we're really excited about getting it on stage, and, and it should be pretty cool.
We've had a lot of fun playing, and you know, it's. I'm sure it sounds like everybody says this, but but you know, Germany's been really good to us, and, and so it's going to be fun to get back there. And it's one of the first places that kind of supported us when when our first album came out, and uh, it's going to be fun, right, Shirley? We've been everywhere a lot of times. It's hard yeah. to keep up with every language in the <laughs> in the world, but we have had to. A lot of support from our German fans. In the 70s, I lived there for a year, and I was an exchange student in a little town called Leichingen by Um. I speak Schwäbisch. I didn't speak any German before I spoke Schwäbisch, so actually I'm not very good at it, but I can understand what you, what you guys say, so watch it. This is really easy. The one that has lorded over me for two years now is Timothy Duncan from the San Antonio Spurs. Let me show, I've even got a picture of him, I'll show you. He's so hot. I have him in my mobile phone. He's so sexy. I'm sure you'll agree. <sighs> Look at him. Behold, for there is a man with fine loins. Seven foot. Oh, he's so hot. So that's my boy of the year and of last year and maybe the year before that too. I have got an advanced copy of the Queens of the Stone Age, which I love. Um, I love Razor Light. I'm big into them. I love Kasabian. I'm trying to think of anything new that I've got. I'm still really into the Bjork record. I love that. Actually, I find it easier than the one before. I find that the album beforehand, I, I, I couldn't really get into it. But I, I really love this album. There's certain parts of it that remind me of like the Sugar Cubes. It has that very bare, raw energy for me that that came off her when she first came out and that's I love that about that record actually their screensaver was was our computer screensaver uh, for the entire making of this record so use that how you wish but uh, maybe in a small way Ramstein was was a bit of an inspiration for us <laughs> on our new album bleed like me available soon That's right. And the making of the record, uh, a backhoe, which is like a bulldozer with a big scoop that comes out. And it, at 7 a.m., this guy was driving into Madison and he ran a, a light at the intersection where our studio is and had to avoid hitting a car. And he, it, it crushed the wall of the studio and went into the ISO booth into the studio. If someone had been there in the studio, they would have been killed. And luckily it was at 7 in the morning. There's, you know, we usually don't start until noon. So. Very, very annoying, too, because it, it took about a month to get fixed and cost a lot of money, which our insurance pay for. But still, it's just one of those freaky things that uh, throws you for a loop when it happens. Initially, I don't know if we really thought of using different producers, but as the record went on, there hit a point where we kind of hit a wall and thought maybe we should collaborate with people, which, as it turned out, really didn't quite work as well. But... I think initially we were going to record most of it in Madison, and then I have a home studio. Duke's got a home studio, so we do some work at home. But after we took a break, we decided to try recording out here. We ended up doing some a couple songs. Well, Bad Boyfriend really is the only song that we recorded out in, in uh, Los Angeles, but we did drum tracks on... We went and did some drums in uh, Sound City, which is the same studio that, that I did Nevermind at. But the bulk of the record was still done at Smart Studios, probably 70%, maybe, something like that. It actually sounds better. Smart sounds better now. Now that a backhoe is run into the wall, it sounds a lot better. We built it in. We couldn't remove it, so we just built it into the building. <laughs> it's, it's still there. sitting there. <laughs> There's a pretty good picture. If you look on the... You can probably find it somewhere on the internet. There was this picture of the someone shot a friend of ours who came down that morning, and you can see the damn thing stuck into the side of the studio. It's pretty frightening looking. Well, it was interesting. We we'd been working, you know, together on all these other garbage records and countless records before that. So, working with somebody new like that was. Interesting. It was a bit of a shock. I think it took some getting used to. And, and you know, we worked with him for uh, almost a month. So by the fourth week, we definitely had an idea of, of how he worked. And he certainly had an idea of how we worked. 
I think it was it was a interesting experience for both sides because I'm sure he never worked with anybody like us before just because of our idiosyncrasies that we have and and so it, it, you know and we we came away from it feeling fairly heartened but then when we listened to to the rough mixes we just realized that maybe we were barking up the wrong tree you know and we we just realized that we were pretty set in our ways and that and that we you know the way we worked was pretty good yeah. i think it kind of did just working with somebody new it's like picking up a new guitar and playing with it just the, just the feel of a new guitar a different guitar can inspire you somehow or playing on a different keyboard or whatever using a different golf club you know can can sometimes change the way you play and so working with a different producer kind of opened our eyes to maybe you know i think it kind of reinvigorated us inspired us a bit to just keep going on what we were doing and we i think we just looked at it a different way and we appreciated what we had done in the past <laughs> intimidated oh i i i don't know i i think you anytime you walk into something like that there's a certain feeling of apprehension and maybe feeling slightly intimidated but i think once we all started just you know concentrating on the music you forgot about that i think every now and then there'd be a minor disagreement about how to proceed but i think for the most part we just sort of kept our mouths shut that's what we wanted to do and we just kind of let him call the shots because we we just we kind of wanted to let him see how he would approach what we were doing and it was hard to do. I mean, it's that's not to say we walked around in silence and just said yes, yes sir all the time, but we I think for the most part that's what we set out to do and I mean we we gave it a fair shot. Yeah, I mean it's all all four of us have a lot of ideas on everything, you know, on the way a song should sound, the way the track should feel, uh, um artwork videos the set list we're going to draw up before a gig. Uh, and I think Duke's point that it was sort of pertinent, when we worked with John King, it was hard for us to to sort of bite our tongue and just let someone else steer the ship for a while. And I think that was probably the smartest thing we did in the course of the record when we hit a wall because it really did make us realize that we're the only ones who can do it. So we should just, after this, we're going to go back and finish the record. You know, it was kind of a kick in the butt, I think, a sort of a wake-up call to a certain extent. And I don't know that, um, I mean, it just, it, we just got to that point in working on the record where we weren't agreeing on anything, and we needed to shake it up. And so that was the best thing about working with John. And we came up with one great track, Bad Boyfriend. You know, it's, that, that track turned out really good. <laughs> sort of a therapist, yeah. But he'd be the thing is he'd be in working in this behind the studio working on some sound, and the four of us would have to sit in the lounge and talk about stuff, you know. So that in some ways that was the therapy of us all being in kind of a foreign space instead of being. We're so used to working at smart studios, you don't even think about it, and all of a sudden we're sort of plucked out of there and put in a, in a new situation, and it it, it it was awkward. I think that that was good in some ways, even though. It, it wasn't exactly uh, something that we wanted to keep doing. You know, after we were there for a month, we got one song out, and we realized, no, let's go back to Smart now. We know what we need to do. Yeah, I think this is the most rocking album we've made all the way through. It's, it's more cohesive and sounds like we do live. And when we started working on the album, that's the first thing that we said, uh, really the only thing that we said. It's like, let's make this simpler and try and make it sound more like a band live, just feature the guitars. And then, of course, we went through this long, convoluted, crazy process. But by the time the record was finished, that's actually, it ended up kind of what we decided that we wanted to do. And I think it's also got more energy than any record we've made, just the vibe and the tracks the guitar playing and, the, and just the feel and Shirley singing, it, it's all, it pushes. And, and it's not just a matter of us being in the studio. I think some of that maybe came from the tension of working and some of it came from where our heads were at, looking at the world around us, and what's going on socially and politically. And so there's just, to me, this record sounds more like a raw nerve and less like a collection of pop songs. 
Not necessarily, but a lot of times you're not even aware of what you're writing, but it is a reflection on the environment that you live in, you know. Sometimes you might do the opposite. If it's really hard out there, you might pull back and write. Well, there's some really beautiful, quiet songs on the record. Happy Home and It's All Over, but the crying are very intimate and and pulled back compared to, uh, you know, why don't you come over or boys want to fight some of the stuff that's really, or metal heart that's, you know, looks kind of like a frayed nerve. So I don't, I don't know if there's any, it necessarily has to go hand in hand with that, but it's something you can't even put your finger on, but definitely I think the environment outside the band affects our songwriting and our playing as much as the environment of being together in the studio. Yeah, you might be right. I mean, I suppose it's as buzz political as you get. I, I think it's kind of a personal political viewpoint. Um, it has to do with personal politics, the way one relates to the world, the way Shirley relates to the world. I was just uh, messing about on the piano and had a little chord progression, and Shirley liked it. She started. She must have had these lyrics laying around, the metal heart lyrics. And she just started singing along with it, and it was very slow and kind of almost, I don't know, Tori Amo sounding or something, and, and we just ended up speeding it up and uh, became what it is. It became this metal number. Yeah, well, good. Let me write that down. <laughs> I'll make none of that. Big metal comeback in Europe. Release Metal Heart as a single in Germany. We opened for Iron Maiden once. Butch and I, when we were in a band, Spooner, we opened for Iron Maiden. We got pelted with beer cans. We didn't know that we were opening up for Iron Maiden. It was a festival, yeah. So it was dangerous. Our fans were being, you know, beaten up in the audience and everything. So it was an interesting experience, though. And you know what? The Maiden rocked. It's just kind of a warm-up thing. Yeah, we're just playing a few gigs around Europe and a few gigs in America before we, you know, hit the road for... God knows how long. My knee's been bothering me, started bothering me in the end of the last tour, and and I just started trying to get in shape because we're going to start band rehearsals in a couple of weeks, and my knee was bothering me so bad, so I went to see a doctor, and he they did surgery, and I, I should be fine. It's going to be about six weeks of rehab, but hopefully it won't bother me. That's the, that's the main thing. I'm taking my vitamins, though, man. I'm going to just... Eat pretzels, drink beer, and take vitamins, and then I'll stay healthy, I swear to God. We want to get more like Blue Oyster Cult and have five guitars on stage at the end of the show. No, I, it's, I mean, I, I played drums on a bunch of the songs early on and, 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 there's, and some of the tracks, but in some instances I'd rather be behind the glass. And, I mean, Dave Grohl is amazing, and he's way better than I am. Why not get him in? <laughs> we ran into him at a Christmas party last year and said, hey, Dave, we're going to be working in John King's studio. You should come in, and come in and do drums and track. He goes, no problem. And then he just showed up one day and did a couple of takes, and it was amazing. It was amazing to see him play again. Well, I don't know. Yeah, it's an enigma wrapped in a riddle. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure why it it just it just felt like the right thing to do, you know, to get Dave in. And then the same with Matt. It's like, kind of felt like he's really plays ha much harder than I do. And we thought it would be cool to get him in to play to really pump up the volume on the tracks. So there's probably still me playing on some of those in the background. But I, honestly, I don't really care. I just want the tracks to sound great, you know. I don't really care who plays drums. If I didn't feel like I was, the tracks that I did were rocking enough, then let's get someone in to do it. Wisconsin went carry. Don't blame Wisconsin for this. Now, why did the people in the Midwest realize? Well, that whole red and blue map thing is fairly misleading. I mean, the way our electoral process works, if Bush gets more votes than Kerry does in a state, no matter how close it is, even if it's 50, if he gets 51% and Kerry only gets 49, then that state goes red. So a lot of those states were fairly split between Kerry and Bush. It's just who they allow, they award the electoral votes. It's a very complicated system and makes no sense unless you really delve into it. And then I'm still not sure it makes sense. But the, the whole red and blue map thing that I'm sure all Europeans see, 
It looks like the, almost the entire country is for Bush. It's very misleading. Except for the coast. See, I mean, it's rather misleading. Some of those states should be purple, you know, like red and blue mixed together. But uh, Wisconsin, my home state, as well as this state, California, went for Kerry. So don't hold us responsible. It's almost too much to bear when you think about things in terms of how much is spent on defense and how much is how little is spent on just making people's lives better. How much is spent on military weapons and how little is spent on education. When you balance that out, it's a crime. But that kind of imbalance between those things has has been around for a long, long time in this country. I mean, it certainly you know set a record here, but it's it's been that way now for two or three decades where this inordinate amounts of money has been spent. And the minute one, uh, some president tries to slash it, a defense budget, it, you know, there's a big problem. So it didn't start with Bush, and I doubt it'll end with him. It's just a crazy imbalance that the United States has bought into, and, and I dare say a lot of countries around the world have, have bought into it as well. We're sort of shocked that when we finish this record, we realize we've been together 10 years now, and... It's the 11-year itch. We, we never had any idea it was going to last this long, that we were going to enjoy doing it, or, or it would become basically a full-time obsession with the four of us. And I think the cycle through Beautiful Garbage was difficult. I mean, it, a lot of things happened. Our record came out literally the week September 11th happened, which was it seemed preposterous for us to go on and promote a pop record when all the world had changed you know, overnight. And as the tour progressed, I got sick twice and got kicked off the tour. It forced the band had to keep playing, but it's just weird when you pull somebody out of the core. Like Duke said, he's I'm like the only drummer he's played with for like you know we've been playing in bands together for 20 years, and all of a sudden you take me out and put somebody else, and it changes the feel for one thing. And I think it it fractured us, and then we just. I'm not sure that we knew exactly what we wanted to do. We finished the Beautiful Garbage Tour really strong. We played some great shows in Australia, came back and did a a, a pretty big tour of the U.S. And, and felt good. But then when we started working on the new album, we just kind of started spinning around. And I, I think part of it was that each of us individually maybe had different ideas where we thought things should go or songs should go. And in some instances, I don't know that we knew. You know, me personally... I some of the songs I would listen to and I'd go, this might be really good and it might really suck. I can't tell right now. And really, the only way for me to get to that point was just we had to plow ahead and work to the point where I couldn't do it. And I just called these guys up one day. I said, I, I'm going to LA. I'm I'm out of here. I can't deal with this anymore. And then we took a break and and then we went in the studio with John King. We worked for a month and I think all of a sudden that kind of gave us a an idea, okay, you know, what we're doing or how we work, we just got to get back in and start doing it again, and we'll, and we'll work our way through it, and we did. The end of 2003 was the, you know, just trying to work on stuff was hard on all of us. I'm sure I was the one who walked away, but trust me, it could have been any of the four of us. I know that all of us were feeling fairly miserable about where we were with the songs, and, and we just weren't communicating, and... It was hard to tell if someone liked a song idea or whatever, you know, so Duke would bring in a cool thing and I might like it, surely may not like it, or Steve would bring in something I would like it, surely wouldn't like it. Or I, I realized though the other day that a lot of how the songs get finished, either we jam on something as a band or Duke brings in a song idea or I bring in a song idea or Steve brings in a song idea, and then we'll work on it. If Shirley gets excited about it, and then she starts writing lyrics and melodies, and then the song takes off. But if she doesn't, she's not inspired by it, then the song sort of wallows around, and, and it's, then it takes sometimes a lot of work or drastic sort of rewriting or changing it to get to the point where her and the rest of the band is jazzed about it. And, uh, which is what I think is cool about this record. It, it's Even though it was a long process, the songs as a whole, I think, are the most cohesive as any album that we've done. We probably had 50 song ideas at, at, at the end of 2003, early 2004. I, I, I mean, just tons of stuff, you know, with, with uh, working titles like Beans and Franks or, or you know, and they're, uh, just stuff that we would all bring in and stuff that we would jam on. And it, it's sometimes, there might have been some better songs that we were working on that didn't make 
the record, but it just, as it turned out, how we are working and how the four of us were trying to get songs finished, it, it's just a process that we have to go through where everybody feels excited about it. It's, it's really strange. It's kind of hard to to articulate. You just gotta, you'd have to be a fly in the wall and watch the process of how, how we do it to, to see how it kind of goes through through our psyches individually and collectively as a band. I don't think there's anything really that much different about the making of this record than any others. It's just that things just got more weird than they usually do. You know, there was more <laughs> second guessing. There was more, you know, panic and, and wondering where the hell we're going to it got to the point where we actually just stopped for a little while, but it really wasn't that much different. Every record has gone through the same, the same trauma. It's just that this set of record, God knows what we'll do next time we make a record. There'll maybe yeah, it'll be four years. It's basically the same process with just the, you know higher highs and lower lows. And I think the ultimate low was probably prior to butch leavings when it happened i think once i mean nobody really left somebody went home somebody took a break i mean if he 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 just happened to live out of town you know nobody quit nobody tended their resignation we just took a break and you know somebody had to say it you know when butch went home i just kept working at home so it wasn't like i i didn't just stop i think he did too i think he went home and worked We've all been talking about it. I, I think my favorite songs that we've done on all the records are the bummer songs. Like, I love Bleed Like Me, and I love Happy Home, and I love It's All About the Crying. And all of our albums, those the slower, dark, melancholy ones, are the ones that have stayed with me the longest. And we've talked about making a bummer album that's all, there's not necessarily any singles, no rock. It's all really stripped down like Leonard Cohen style just as dark and depressing as and as morose as we can get and i think it would be amazing i'd be so happy to listen to a record like that all the time i i don't know why it is i think a lot of people love dark depressing songs you relate to them in some way that makes you feel better i think shirley is her when she sings really quiet and understated like that her voice is amazingly powerful that, that's why i love those songs like the trick is to keep breathing or milk off the first record i don't know we'll we'll see that's a ways off obviously we just finished bleed like me and i think we're we're just now getting ready to get into boot camp so (laughs) there's not going to be any any recording a bummer record in the near future but somewhere down the line maybe just some of the i didn't do a whole record just some of the tracks on it in fact, I was going to try and, if we had finished Bleed Like Me earlier, I was going to try and do some outside production before we started touring and stuff, but then the record just took so long to get finished. But yeah, I mean, I still really want to do that. In fact, I when we finish this touring cycle, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to do some outside work. But for now, I mean, we're I'm jazzed about you know where we are with this record, and it's going to be exciting to go out and make a noise on stage every night. I think these are going to be, these songs are going to translate better live than any record that we've made too. I mean, we don't know that yet because we haven't attempted, yeah, I better knock on wood here. <clears throat> but I mean, hopefully they're, they're going to be really cool to play live. We, we are into Ramstein. We watch that DVD of his live concert all the time in the studio. I'm not kidding. Uh, we're serious, though. We had a, it, it was on one of the DVDs that was playing all the time in the studio. We think they're alternately uh, impressive musically and some of the power behind the music and also just kind of funny, you know? We just find them kind of entertaining in kind of a funny way. You find yourself laughing and then going, wow. But let's not overstate the uh, influence that Ramstein had on this <laughs> They have more pyro in their shows than, uh, you know, you can probably even do legally in America these days. They have more pyro on one show than we've ever had in our life. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. We're trying to hire the uh, pyro guy that Ramstein uses away from them. No. I don't know. What are we going to... No, I don't think there's going to be any animals. No live animals. (laughs) 